Kenjaku has already won. Gojo and Sukuna are nothing more than mere puppets, pawns dancing on the palm of his hands. He's got Hindu and Japanese god cursed spirits ready for the main cast. He actually has a true plan for Yuji and even a backup contingency plan for Yuta too. And this isn't even mentioning just how powerful he is now with Tengen. It's gonna be a lot of Kenjaku hype this video, so trust me, if you're a Kenjaku fan, you're gonna wanna watch the whole thing. Hey, do you solid and leave a like, it does help out. And of course, subscribe for a ton more JJK content just like this. Crazy theories, JJK spoiler videos, power scaling analysis, live streams trust me if you love jjk you will not regret subscribing and of course thank you to east guys and that guy trait thank you guys very much now the first thing to bring up is that he actually doesn't need sukuna or even gojo for this plant now remember in shibuya after they sealed gojo funny enough we're actually going to see this next week in the anime too when the curses say they actually want to kill yuji Tadori, mainly mahito and choso kenjaku just says do as you wish sukuna is nothing more than a contingency plan if the prison realm doesn't work out so it seems like at least considering the binding vows made between sukuna and kenjaku it is pretty one way and it's heavily favoring Kenjaku since Kenjaku doesn't need to protect Sukuna or he doesn't need to make sure he lives until a certain point. Whereas vice versa, remember Sukuna just couldn't let Gojo kill Kenjaku because of a binding vow. Kenjaku had him on a tight leash. He had it very strongly wrapped around Sukuna's neck. Where Sukuna just couldn't let him die. Which is interesting because it implies that Kenjaku actually made the binding vow of Sukuna from a position of power. He had all the advantages. And here's the second thing I want to bring up. When he was fighting Choso, Choso asked Ask him, tell me, what do you want from Yuji? You have something else in mind, unlike us who you've neglected for 150 years. What are you plotting? Kenjaku responds, actually, he doesn't have a specific role. You could say being a vessel is his role, and that's already in place. Yuji Itadori is like a fire signaling the start. As long as he and Sukuna are alive, the chain of curses will never end. He is the eye of the storm of a new age. Now, this is pretty interesting since it's implying that Yuji's only purpose of being alive, or only reason being made, is just to be a vessel for Sukuna. And this actually does go back all the way when Yuji and Megumi were actually talking with Hakari and they found it weird how Yuji was already considered a player. Since the fact that he was considered a player because he had Sukuna, that would only make sense had he made it after being contracted from Kenjaku. Which is why Megumi found it insanely weird since when Megumi remembers, he even says, I saw you eat the finger of your own will, Kenjaku didn't make you eat it, so why are you counted as a player? And then Megumi says, we'll discuss later, and of course they never actually do, so we never get an answer to that, but right then and there, Yuji eating the finger is something that Kenjaku plotted or he was the cause of Yuji eating it. He must have just set things up from the very beginning and I wouldn't be surprised if you remember the guy and the girl from the occult club right where they had the Sukuna finger it would really not be shocking at all if Kenjaku was somehow the one who actually pushed them to take the finger or maybe let them know in an offhanded way and he actually triggered the chain of events that led to Yuji actually consuming the finger. Or well, this could even be something even deeper than that from when he was a child and he gave birth to him because remember he is actually Yuji's mother. But regardless, I just wanted to bring that up since that will be important later on. And the last thing is that the only reason he actually wanted to get rid of Gojo from the beginning was just so that he could make the Cullen game happen. The reason he says you just have to go is because had Gojo been around when the Cullen game was actually made, Gojo alone would have ended the Cullen game in uh, probably a couple hours at best, maybe a day, a half a day or something. Because this man would have just entered a colony, wipe out every single player in under an hour, get hundreds of points, change all the rules, and just make the Cullen game null and void. That was the whole reason why he needed to seal Gojo, and yes, Gojo was eventually unsealed, it doesn't actually matter since Kenjaku got his goal. He collected all the cursed energy that he needed from the Cullen game and even from the soldiers. So that's why Gojo being unsealed doesn't actually matter. Yes, he could have killed Kenjaku, but he didn't. Kenjaku's still around with Tengen, with all the cursed energy he needs, and he can still make the merger. And remember back when Kenjaku was talking to Urume? Urume says, sending armed non-sorcerers against Cullen game players will heighten the colony's cursed energy and end the custom preceding merger with Tengen. That's basically your plan, isn't it? Kenjaku replies, that's about 60% of it. Except for Tokyo and Sendai, each colony's cursed energy is still insufficient. As an insurance, I send in various nations' armed forces, but I doubt the fighting will be that intense. Players who have taken flesh are another matter, but the awakened type will struggle. Many awakened sorcerers are strong, but reluctant to kill. If casualties mount, the military will pull out, and since non-sorcerers don't yield many points, the players won't pursue. Odume says, I thought the reason you sent in the military at night was to give them an advantage. When the soldiers die, they release large amounts of cursed energy. But aren't non-Japanese an exception? Kenjaku says they usually have no connection to cursed energy, but the moment of death is different. The stress of death causes a slight change in their brains. At first, I didn't intend to pit sorcerers against soldiers, but even without such a contest, it's a natural law that non-sorcerers can't win. I've released countless cursed spirits into all the colonies, and 
night is where they reside. And then we actually see Angel explain this to Yuji and Megami. Angel theorizes that it's a fail safe in case the Culling Game players don't produce enough cursed energy. As they ask, but why would a thousand normal people come flooding into Colony? Takuma says, it's probably my fault, my fans are rabid. That was pretty good. And we saw that all the soldiers did die in very gruesome deaths, even though Yuji and Gang did save a couple. Right now, Kenjaku has enough cursed energy to proceed to the merger with Tengen. He actually has enough right now. But the reason he hasn't done it is because he doesn't want the main cast to get in the way, and that's actually why he created that Culling Game rule, where the Culling Game will only end when all the players except Ghetto and Megami have died. And that's because to start the merger, the Culling Game actually needs to end. And when the brainwashed Tengen asked, why don't you just end the Culling Game with me just destroying the pure barriers that he can do, and that was the whole secret that Tengen actually kept from the students. And Kenjaku replies, because then the barriers for the ritual merger with you would disappear. And obviously this is quite the dilemma, since he needs the Culling Game to end, and he could just use Tengen to end it, but then if the barriers disappear, he can't actually do the merger, because he needs those barriers to actually do the ritual for the merger. But considering the fact that Kenjaku can actually make glitches, and even rules that conflict with the Culling Game, or that the Culling Game doesn't want him to make, I really do feel like he is actually someone who can end the Culling Game prematurely. And this is by just creating new rules saying, if you don't listen to me, I will just use Tengen to end the game right now. So yeah, he has all the cursed energy he needs, the barriers and rituals stay in place, all that's left is for the Culling Game to end. If he can just somehow end it, which I'm sure he can do, and he probably has many other ways if his main way doesn't pan out, since he's had a whole month to prep and plan for contingencies and such, and backup plans. And I mean, this was the guy who actually sealed Gojo with prep time, there's nothing Thing he can't do with prep time, something as simple as just ending the culling game in a different way, given the time he has and given the fact that he has a lot of points and he has Tengen in his hands, yeah, I'm sure he has something ready that is just unarguable. Now, what I'm very interested in is the fact that he actually says that the barriers are required for the ritual. He says the ritual for the merger. Basically, what the merger is, is he's actually going to use Tengen and his barriers to basically just fuse everyone or at least all the humans in Japan. And just a clarification, this can't actually affect all the sorcerers since there are a lot of people confused saying how can he even start the merger because if he does wouldn't that mean the main cast all die? No actually even if you have a tiny bit of cursed energy and you can control it you can just simply outright reject the merger so all the sorcerers are safe though it's very questionable if Maki's safe but considering the fact that she has just zero cursed energy maybe she truly is just safe from the merger since she is the one that actually lies outside of destiny and cursed energy and all that so I doubt it could even affect her just like the sorcerers. However this doesn't mean that Tengen is actually the vessel for the merger. He's just the one that's combining them all together and using his barriers to actually do this. Since his main body is kind of like all the barriers now, we did see he had a true body, but it is everywhere at the same time now as well. And I do wonder again, the key word, a ritual. What if the ritual is to actually place the merger or the combination of everything into a person? And yes, this is a long time theory that has been around for a very long time. It is that Yuji would actually be the vessel for the merger. Now to go back to what I said in the beginning of the video with what he said to Choso, that he has no plans of Yuji and that if he has anything, it's just that his role is to just be a vessel. But he says it's already in place and that's with Sukuna. But he said that at the time when Yuji was the vessel, now things have changed quite a lot. Sukuna's new vessel is Megami and Yuji is just still out there. He is a cursed object, very powerful, soaked in Sukuna's cursed energy. There is nothing he can't handle. Now there's this theory that Sukuna is going to be the vessel for the merger, which is definitely still possible. I made a whole video on that alone, which I won't get into now since it's just too much to explain here. So if you think it's not possible or it's impossible for any of those reasons, I would highly recommend checking out the video I made on that, where I go into depth and detail about actually why it's possible. It doesn't even need to be Sukuna if he can't get his hands on that. I mean, Yuji's right there. A vessel is his role. He's soaked in Sukuna's cursed energy. He is a cursed object. And remember, Yuji has his soul swapping ability, and there's all these different theories, and this is just a completely separate theory, where Yuji's gonna place his soul inside of Megami's body, and him and Megami inside of Sukuna's innate domain, or his own innate domain, are gonna fight Sukuna from the inside, right? And that's where the tag team's gonna happen. But then what's gonna happen to Yuji's lifeless body? It's just gonna be there, an empty husband without a soul. That's what a lot of people are questioning, like, what, is Yuji just gonna be laying there on the ground somewhere in the corner? It's possible that Kenjaku might see this and sneakily, while no one's noticing, he might just snatch Yuji's body and use it as the centerpiece for the ritual or the place where basically the merger is gonna all gonna go inside of Yuji's body. And Yuji wouldn't have a soul. Think about it, Yuji is just perfect for this role. Like I said before, he's got the role of a vessel, soaked in Sukuna's cursed energy, he's a cursed object, and he doesn't have a soul now? <laughs> That's the perfect person to house a merger. I feel like this is one of those things Series that's been around for a decent amount of time, but as time is going on and we just see more from the series, like we learn Yuji's a cursed object, we learn that he can potentially swap his soul out. I feel like these just strengthen the theory more and more. And I want to remind everyone as well, Sukuna from the beginning is just nothing more than a mere contingency, which is crazy to say of Sukuna. And I mean, again, he's got him on a leash of his binding vows. It's pretty insane. And even Gojo is someone that I have no doubt
now who he will deal with. He's probably got plans for, I mean, there we go, Sukune is the plan to deal with Gojo, like he said himself. The prison realm doesn't work out. His true goal is the merger and that is far bigger than both of them because he is the biggest villain of JJK. And real quick, before we get into the juicy stuff with the god curses, I'm gonna highlight some Kenjaku thoughts from the channel members. Explosive Grape just says, he's the GOAT, true. He's got the Kenjaku emojis too. The Eternal Flame says, EOS, he's going to fight everyone in the cast at once other than Yuji and Megumi who will be fighting Sukuna. And of course, shout out Eternal Flame, he's a goated YouTuber. And yes, I actually think this is true and I do think the god curses are gonna play a role into this. I'm about to touch into that. And for the next comment, just an NSFW warning. So skip like 10 seconds if you don't wanna see it. Iki says that Kenjaku is the undisputed strongest backshot taker. And remember Kenjaku did get cream pied all for the sake of his, or actually her at the time, plans. And for the sake of Jujutsu Science, they just took it raw. It is what it is. I gotta respect the dedication to his evil plans. Okay, now as for some juicy theories about some of the curses that he has and what he will throw at the main cast, remember he did have quite an interesting curse when he was fighting Yuki, Ganesha, which is actually a Hindu deity. And he did actually say to Yuki that he got it overseas from an Asian country. Now it's interesting how this is a curse which is not from Japanese gods, right? It's from outside of Japan. It's a Hindu god. When Kenjaku even explains where he got the curse, he's implying that he didn't get it in Japan. He just says an Asian country. Which yes, Japan is an Asian country, but again, in the context, he's implying that it's another country. Now, I want to remind people, Ganesha is a very powerful curse, like super powerful. The only reason Yuki is able to one-shot it is because, okay, Yuki is special raid, but also, literally, its whole ability and curse technique just was unfortunately completely negated and countered by Yuki, who can ignore concepts. It was just a really, really unfortunate matchup. Had that Ganesha curse been up against even Yuta or Sukuna, like, yes, those guys could one-shot it, but at least its curse technique could have been effective and done some things against it. And again, the fact that he has a curse from outside of Japan, the reason that's actually interesting is because it was said that only Japanese people can create cursed energy, except, actually remember what we said earlier in the video, is that even non-Japanese people can create cursed energy at the moment of their death, which causes them stress, and this will release cursed energy. So maybe this is where these gods come from, from other worlds. When people are dying and they're stressed out and it changes their brains to create cursed energy, they are probably thinking about the gods and praying to them or fearing them or saying, will I go to heaven and hell? And that's maybe how these gods are made. And if that is the case, this could really imply that there could be other gods. So just from Hinduism, we have the god of creation, Brahma, if I'm pronouncing it right, or very famously Shiva, the god of destruction from Hinduism. You know, maybe some Greek gods like the Zeus god or Norse gods like Thor and Odin. And of course, some Japanese gods, and this would actually be more prevalent and these curses would be the strongest since all Japanese people have cursed energy and this would probably create the strongest form of cursed energy for creating a cursed spirit. So maybe Indra and Susano, and we do know that there are actually Japanese mythical beings such as the nine-tailed fox and the Yamato Orochi already as cursed spirits and Sukuna's two weapons that he has in the cover page, the Trishula, and most importantly, the Vajra. The Vajra is actually a weapon of injuries. So Gege is clearly using, as we're seeing, Hindu and Japanese gods and mythologies and such in the story. And maybe he has other super strong curses too, such as the big free vengeful cursed spirits. That would be super crazy. Imagine if the main cast has to fight them. Or perhaps just some super elite other cursed spirits, such as the Death Curse. And this is something that Isekai is in an honorable member of the channel actually even ask. Honestly, if there was a death curse and considering that every human on the planet, at the moment of death, it actually causes them to create cursed energy and that comes out of them because they all fear it, that would be the strongest curse we have ever seen. And I mean, seriously, who would be stronger than that? This thing, if it really does exist, might just be stronger than Gojo or Sukuna. And considering how powerful it is, I doubt Kenjaku would even be able to control it if such a thing existed. And there could even just straight up be the Kami curse spirit, right? The Kami vengeful curse, because this was actually a thing in the Nihon Shoki, which is actually the Chronicles of Japan book, which Gege actually read and is where he actually got Sukuna from and even created him from. And in the Nihon Shoki, it actually says that the vengeful curse spirit, Kami, just straight up god, was actually the one who killed Emperor Chuai, an emperor in Japan's history. But yeah, whatever insane curses Kenjaku has, it would be really awesome to see. And if he throws them at the main cast, it would be so cool to see each of them individually trying to best these god curses. Whether it's Hindu gods, Japanese gods, Greek, Norse, just regular gods gods, or even concepts such as deaths, maybe the vengeful free curse spirits. If anyone has them, it's Kenjaku, and remember he has had a month to prep for this, a month to create contingencies, so he really could have just been traveling Japan or even traveling abroad during this month and collecting the cursed spirits secretly. And as for what I think he's going to do with Yuta, I do think, I made a whole video on this, I think he's actually going to take Yuta's body, and remember, he himself did say that he sees nothing special in Yuta, like nothing at all, so you might be questioning, so why would he take his body? I actually think that they're going to push Kenjaku Jaku to the brink and I think Yuta's actually going to get a big power up and he's going to be the one to do that. However, Kenjaku is going to use 
use Tengen and mainly his domain expansion and the body swap specifically that curse technique into his domain expansion have that as a sure hit and guarantee himself to take a body and if he takes Yuta's body then it's just GG because remember he would actually keep curse spirit manipulation even after he leaves Ghetto's body because he gets to keep three curses one the body swap curse that he always has two the curse technique of the person who's his body's in so right now it's Ghetto and three the curse technique for some reason of the person who was in the body of before because that's ingrained into his brain or something and in this case it's Kyori Itadori her anti-gravity so if he gets Yuta's body he would lose the anti-gravity but importantly he would keep the curse spirit manipulation because obviously that's important because he needs it to control Tengen so if he gets Yuta's body it's not like he would lose that and I mean goddamn, a powered up Yuta or even the current Yuta we have with all of his cursed energy with Kenjaku's genius with Kenjaku's curse spirit manipulation and Rika oh god who is stopping that because he also has copy too and it's actually possible that he might be able to store the anti-gravity rather than just losing it into Rika as a storage and still keep that if he gets Yuta's body. My god, it is just crazy to think. But what do you think Kenjaku will do in the final arc? Let me know your crazy theories in the comments down below and be sure to leave a like if you did enjoy, it does help out a lot. If you haven't already subscribed for a ton of JJK content just like this, crazy theories, power scaling, JJK spoiler videos, live streams, trust me if you love Jujutsu Kaisen, you will not regret subscribing. And of course, thank you to all the channel members as well. Thank you guys very much, it is much appreciated. And that's all, take care and have a nice day.